Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Andrew, now at least. And I'm here to talk about Anchor, which is a tool that we have developed to do um, static analysis and symbolic execution using VEX. Um, like I said, I am a researcher. I'm, I'm an undergraduate student at the University of California, Santa Barbara. We work in what we call the Sec Lab. Um, we are, like most of the people in this room, interested in finding bugs in software. And because we are researchers, we are interested in publishing papers about finding bugs in software. The more, the more automatic, the better in this case. And also, we are CTF players. CTF, as many of you, some of you may know, is Capture the Flag. It's a computer security game. It's, it's, a, it's fun, you know? It's, it's about um, taking the security, security tasks and making them into fun challenges that you can solve for points, occasionally money. But what we really like to do, to do as all these different categories of people is have some way to perform binary analysis tasks in useful, modular, modularizable, abstracted ways. And to that end, we have developed a system called Anger. And Anger is, the tagline is, a highly modular Python framework that performs binary analysis using VEX as an intermediate representation. In fact, the name Anger is a pun on VEX, because when something is vexing, it makes you angry. Probably, at least, probably half of our code base is pun-based. Is this true, or are you making that up? Oh, no, no, that's totally true. <laughs> the, you know, the, 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 GUI, the graphical interface for Angular is called Angular Management. <laughs> <laughs> and so the idea of Angular is that it is made of many interlocking parts which provide useful abstractions for analysis. So the point, so the first part of this presentation is going to be detailing the pile of abstractions that we call Angular. So, Interlocking part one is PyVex, which is effectively a FFI foreign functions interface wrapper around libvex. So this is, the this is the bread and butter of all of our further analysis that we'd like to be able to do. We would like to be able to run a line of Python and have out a Python object, which is the intermediate representation superblock, the IRSB, that contains the vex. IR code that is much more easily analyzed than just x86 bytes or ARM bytes or what have you. Um, so, uh, so the way we we done we done this is um, there's a whole lot of whole lot of hacking into libvex in order to actually get the IRSB object there out out, and then we deep copy it into a set of Python classes that represent the internal VEX structs that are easy to work with in Python. So you can just drill into an IRSB and say, well, what's the third statement's operation, and what are its arguments, which are a read temp and a constant statement. Uh-oh. Oh, good. That's much better. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. Um, and technically, this can be totally independent of libvex, the library, because we have an interface in which you can write lifters in pure Python, and we've done this for AVR, MSP430, and BrainFuck. Uh, yeah, no. <laughs> um, so that's interlocking part number one. Interlocking part number four is called simivex. Simivex is jumping ahead a little, the actual symbolic execution that we do with IRSBs. So um, I'll explain what exactly symbolic execution is in a moment and how exactly it works. But for now, you just need to know that it takes the IRSBs that we have generated via PyVex and executes them. Um, and, but it technically supports execution from other interfaces that aren't VEX. SimiVEX has grown into a, be a little bit of a misnomer as we've grown and expanded the library to support more things. But it's the VEX is the first and the best supported, and it's also in the name. So. So most important, if you're going to emulate IRSBs, you're going to need to emulate the effects of each of the kind of IR statements, expressions, operations, dirty calls, and clean calls. Um, but ultimately, the abstraction that you get out of Simivex is this concept of a simulated state, which is a representation of a program state as a, at a given time. And the symbolic execution process is one that produces, given a state, any number of successors that could possibly result 
from executing that state. Um, so once we get into the part, once we start thinking about executing things, we need to start thinking about the environment in which we execute things. So we need to start thinking about how do we model memory, how do we model registers. Vex has sort of decided the answers to those questions for us. We have a flat memory space and a flat register file. Um, but other than that, you need to start providing well, what happens when you hit the IJK sys and you need to emulate a, emulate a syscall. What happens when, how do you actually model those syscalls and their, envi and their events symbolically, and et cetera. Um, so one of the things that we use to make this work whatsoever is this module called Clarify in our locking part number two. Um, so Valgrind and its friends will want to use Vex and emulate these things, and in all the registers there will be integers. But what we want is we not want not integers, but symbolic bit vectors, which are effectively variables that can be built up into trees, and then you can, and then you, so you, you get in, end up with ASTs of just variables and values and operations that. that and then you can reason about, well, what if there were a constraint saying that this value must be greater than this value? And you just say that that is an assertion over the current program state. Then once, with, once that assertion is in place, you can use an SMT solver, such as Z3, in order to reason about additional values that therefore must be a certain value given this constraint. So Clarify is the abstraction layer that allows us to reason about bit vectors as well as integers as well as any number of domains that we will, some, that we will sometimes choose to use for um, static analysis. Um, so as a brief interlude here, let's talk about like, what the actual process of symbolic execution looks like. So we're going to show you how symbolic execution executes a program and what we can do with that. And these slides are stolen from every single other presentation about anger ever. So pretend for a moment that we have this code slice. We don't even have to pretend. There it is. So we're going to start execution up here, the blue line. And we're going to start with a sort of blank slate, blank state that contains sort of that well, says that, well, we don't know what x is yet. And there's no constraints on this state yet. But we do know our instruction pointer is there. So when we tick forward, um, we're going to, uh, I should have said, OK, so when I say, when I say x is question marks. What I actually mean is x is a symbolic value. That is, x is user input. And we don't know, have any idea, we don't have any conception of what that value could be. So we'll just create a symbol x and say that is x. Then as we tick execution forward, we will hit that branch statement. And there are two possible things, places that, that, that the CPU could jump to after that instruction. It could either jump to here, or it could jump to here. And in symbolic execution, we take both. So this initial state produces two successor states, state AA and state AB. In it, x, we still have no conception about what the actual value of x is, but we do now have a constraint. In an assertion over the domain of values that x may take on. That is, in this state AA, we know that x must be uh, less than 10. And in state AB, x must be greater than or equal to 10. So and so then, uh, yeah, yeah the, so the process of, a, the process of simulvex, the symbolic execution, is effectively computing that this constraint so it is extracting the idea of this constraint from the code and placing it in the actual state. So that, so if we just sort of continue the example, we are now going to take the state um, AB, because that's the one that's getting us closer to the U win, because we're, we're trying to win here. That's what we're here to do. So then, then state AB is going to further branch on the second if statement. And it's going to add the constraint, uh, again, constra add the constraints on the state x is less than 100, x is greater than or equal to 100. And so now we can say that that state uh, ABA is the state that is, ends up being at the u win spot. And we can 
tell that. So therefore, we just invoke a constraint solver on the value of x given those variables. And we end up with, well, there, there is a possible value of x that could and does cause the program to take that path. So that's symbolic execution. That's the goal here. So as sort of a side note, the, the third interlocking part and in our very out of order list of interlocking parts is a binary loader that we implemented for the Angular project. It's called Clay. It stands for Clay Loads Everything. Um, it's very complicated. It's, talking about it is not at all within the scope of the presentation, but it ought to be mentioned since it is important. It, takes a, does, it does the job of a dynamic loader. It takes a library and executables and turns them into an address space. Um, I did most of the work on that. It's very hard. Don't ever try to do that. <laughs> so then interlocking part number five, the last part, there's an infinite number of interlocking parts, but let's pretend that there's a finite number, so there's five of them, is anger, the actual top level control module. So this takes all these abstractions and puts them together into a control interface called a project, which allows convenient access to symbolic execution and also several built-in analyses that do a lot of common tasks, like control flow, graph recovery, data flow analysis, et cetera, et cetera. And additionally, it has a knowledge base that allows, you, that allows analyses to store artifacts that, of truth that it is found about the program it is analyzing. So here in this example, this is just copied from our um, homepage. It, imports anger, loads a this sort of fake firmware binary foeware, performs a control flow graph analysis on it, and now the project's knowledge base has been populated with a listing of all the functions in the binary. For example, here's the entry point, here's the main function, here's two functions conveniently called accepted and rejected, et cetera, et cetera. And then we create an abstraction called a path group, which is a control interface for symbolic execution, and tell the path group to just blindly tick forward until it finds any state that lives at this address, which is conveniently, I'm pretty sure this hex address is the same as this accepted state address in hex. Um, so, we, so we just search for a state at that address, and then when, when, we find, when we find one of those states, we ask for a concretization of standard input, and it Find, tells us the password for this, for this firmware. So that's that example. That's just the firmware example. That's the tour de force of here's anger doing static analysis and symbolic execution really fast. That was a lot. <laughs> um, anger is big and complicated, but a lot of care has been taken to make it a stack of useful abstractions so that any part of the binary analysis process can be easily instrumented. And um, what can we do with Angular? Well, we can analyze a lot of things. We can do symbolic execution, as I've shown. There's lots of built-in analyses that ship with Angular. Um, control flow graph, binary diffing, disassembly, backward slicing, data flow analysis, value set analysis, etc. Um, we wrote a, we wrote and then published on a static binary rewriter that can do reassembly of binary programs with instrumentation. Um, there's some limited ability to do type inference. There's, we can do symbolically assisted fuzzing, which is very good for bug finding. We can do automatic exploit generation. And also, if you're us, you can use Anger to build a huge system to um, play an automated form to play, auto play CTF automatically and win third place in the world's first automated CTF called the Cyber Grand Challenge. Um, oh, God, I need to talk about the CGC now. <coughs> so. Oh, do I, do I have, how much time do I have? I've only used 15 minutes. OK. I can talk about the CGC. <laughs> so in the United States of America, there's this part of the government called DARPA. And their job is to throw a lot of money at researchers to do research that they want to do. So one of the things that they've done recently is they decided, well, we want the state of the art for binary analysis and auto exploitation, et cetera, to be advanced. So they said, hey, researchers in the United States, we want you to build a machine that can play against other machines totally autonomously playing the standard game that we call capture the flag. Now, this is sort of a format that DARPA has done in the past. DARPA, um, their original grand challenge was on there was on for self-driving cars. You may have heard of that. There were, they, the grand challenge was let's take this established human sport of car racing and say, can we build AIs to do the same thing? And so the cyber grand challenge is the same thing, but for the game of CTF. Um, so 
this ultimately turned into a huge engineering effort of putting of well, well mm, there's a lot of trauma associated with the four months of horrifying development that went into the CGC, but ultimately we did turn we built a, we built a system called the mechanical fish to use anger at its core to analyze binaries, find vulnerabilities, and then patch those vulnerabilities, turn turn the vulnerabilities into exploits, and then launch those exploits against a, a series of opponents on a closed network, and win us a million and a half dollars. <laughs> That was pretty good. Um, yeah, uh, this is all open source. The anger is totally open source. The all of the mechanical fish is also open source. I should mention it's just sort of sitting up on GitHub. If you wanted to kickstart a robot uprising, it's probably a good place to start. Um, so there's some of the analysis capabilities of Anger, but what you can also do, ah, what you can also do is build a community. Well, that's what we've done. It's because a lot of people seem to be using Anger for some reason, and we've got 100 people idling on our Anger, on our IRC channel, and we've got over 100 people on our Slack channel asking questions about why did my script break, and we've got a really nice the community on GitHub talk where we. People are submitting pull requests, opening issues, and people are servicing pull requests that aren't the core research team in the SEC lab, and it's mind-boggling that people do this for us. And what we've also done is we've also made friends with other open source projects that we use. Um, for example, Z3, Capstone, Unicorn Engine, Quima, we've all, we've I've mostly made patches to those systems and then submitted them and had them accepted. And for some of these, for Z3, Capstone, not quite Capstone yet, Capstone's being finalized, and, but Unicorn Engine, we manage, I manage, I manage package distribution for some of those things. So we're making friends. We're doing lots of good things out in the open source world. So that's fun. And ultimately, all this is possible because we can lift binary code to Vex and ex execute it symbolically. That's the primary operation down here. But we started building Anger. I shouldn't say we. I like, to, I like taking credit for all these things. But Anger was started before I came into the SecLab around 2013. And when, when, when I started building Anger, the question was, well, what analysis IR do you actually want to use? So that's part two of this talk, which is a brief summary of other analysis IRs. First up is BAP, the Binary Analysis Platform, which is an IR that comes out of um, CMU, Carnegie Mellon University, also in the United States, for their research. Most notably, their bug finding tool called Mayhem is powered by BAP. Um, as a brief side note, CMU was originally using VEX, but they were completely unable to deal with implementing all the clean helpers and dirty helpers, so they just in they made their, their own lifter. And as a, also important to note that CMU's research, CMU Research's spin-off company, For All Secure, won first place in the CGC. They kicked our asses. Uh, not by much, though. We published an interesting paper looking at the actual gameplay of the CGC and saw um, politics. Um, so the BAP is, BAP is pretty cool. It's written in OCaml by people who actually have a background in, in program analysis. So it's got some cool stuff in it. But on the other hand, it's written in OCaml. And the IR is tied to the, the larger binary analysis platform that they use. Um, but and even further, furthermore, it only, it only supports Intel and ARM. And I'm not even sure if it supports ARM64. And Furthermore, furthermore, when we started Anger, and when they started Anger in 2013, BAP was very heavily fragmented and required a copy of their code base in your tree in order to use. But since then, it has been re totally rewritten. So it's a little better now. If you wanted to use it, you wouldn't be totally insane. Um, next is real, real, not sure how to pronounce that. It's the reverse engineering intermediate language. It's someone published a paper in 2009 designing, describing the ideal binary analysis IR, which is ideal. However, it doesn't actually exist. No one really implemented it. Um, since, so, so there is an open real project that is trying to implement this for x86, but if you decide to implement a binary lifter, you will not implement an analysis platform. You will spend three years designing a binary lifter. So, so we're not so back in 2013 we're not using real. So then there's LLVM. 
this is a pretty serious contender. It's the Clang IR. It is wildly, wildly popular for program analysis. We've started getting program analyst experts coming into our Angular Slack and spouting Haskell at us. And like, all right, I sort of know what a monad is. <laughs> um, anyway, so. LLVM is very robust. It's very established. It's very good. And there's a large community and body of knowledge about how to use it for certain analysis tasks, like various optimization tasks. And symbolic execution with LLVM is 200 lines of C++. So <laughs> that's nice. But on the other hand, it's not really good for our use case. It's designed for compilers, not lifters. It can't, there's no real, it's, very difficult to reason about register allocation from from um, LLVM, and there doesn't really exist an official lifter from binary code to LLVM. It's all the other way. There's some community projects, um, MCSEMA comes to mind by Trail of Bits, that are meant to do that to lift binary code into LLVM. They sort of work, I guess. The last I heard, Trailer Bits has abandoned MCSEMA, though. Don't quote me on that. Um, and it's not, so this isn't really something that we're very interested in using for binary analysis. So then there's TCG, which is the Quimu IR. This is, this is very good. This is what Quimu uses internally to do its optimization and jitting. And one of the really interesting things about being in Quimu is that it suddenly supports everything Quimu supports, which is everything. Everything is supported by Quimu. But then there's, but there's a problem that it's designed to be used for Quimu and nothing but Quimu. So the only implementation is just buried in the depths of Quimu that we once burned an entire intern trying to get it out. But that was weird. Um, but interestingly enough, one of our colleagues in the last few months has successfully done this. So there are patches going into Quimu uh, being talked about right around now that have to do with um, being able to compile Quimu as libtcg. So once that goes through, we would actually be able to run anger on other things that, uh, other things that Quimu supports. Now there is Vex. Does, People, the Vexy people in the audience, does Vex stand for anything? This is very important. It, this is very embarrassing. It actually stood for Valgrind Experimentals. <laughs> Valgrind Experimentals. <laughs> Interesting. It would be better if you didn't know us, so. I'll uh, forget that, don't worry. <laughs> so, good things, very good things about Vex. It's a, obviously got an official implementation, libvex. There it is. And it supports tons of architectures, anything Valgrind support. That's very good. And it is designed for binary analysis and instrumentation. That's also very good. And it's written in C, so it, its structures are well-defined and easy to export to other languages under active development and supports a very wide range of ISAs. Like, if you look into other analysis platforms, they've got long-running issues open for months and years about, well, we've got to support the SSE extensions to x86. Who wants to write that? Nobody. But VEX has that. That's good. Um, there are some issues with VEX, though. For, it is designed for the Valgrind use case. So dynamically executing user mode programs is what it caters to. So. So, and then furthermore, there's no real way to get the IR out of libvex. The, the, vex, the libvex workflow is just this one function, libvex underscore translate, which, it, which does this entire pipeline that um, Julian had on the screen earlier of lift, instrument, optimize, code gen. And we only really care about the first part of that. We only really care about the lifting. So for a while, we had this really, really janky solution that commented out half of libvex tra translate and then used one of the instrumentation fun functions to deep copy out the IRSB. Um, I fixed that recently. That's good. Um, furthermore, you do have to implement a billion IROPs and C calls. And some of them are pretty weird. Like there's IROPs for, so for uh, floating point, sine, and cosine, et cetera. And Furthermore, it's not really SSA. Julian talked about this in the previous talk as well. Um, there's no, this, the IR has no 
interconnectivity of control flow. There's no ability to reason with just the IR about control flow. And furthermore, from a real SSA IR, you want the memory rights and register rights to also be single static assignments. I'm talking some pretty nasty program analysis stuff, so sorry if this is going over people's heads. But none of these are showstoppers, and that's the important thing. VEX is the one that we want to use, and VEX is the one that we ended up using. Um, so that's what the next part of the talk about. Part, that's, that, that's what the next part of the talk is about, words. So what did we do? We forked VEX. Um, there's, a, there's, a fork, there's our fork of VEX sitting at github.com slash anger slash VEX, and it makes a lot of changes to it. And I'm not going to lie, a big part of the, me giving this talk is me being able to be in the same room as a lot of the Valgrind people so we can pitch a whole lot of changes we want to upstream to VEX. There's, there's a lot of them. This is the part where things are going to get very, very technical. Um, so if you're not interested in the specific lines of uh, VEX slash priv slash guest on 2 irc this might be a little weird. So. Ultimately, so, so I talked about the issue of the whole gigantic libvex translate function. So what we did is we split it into two functions, lift and code gen. There's still the libvex translate function that just calls one and then the other. We made sure to maintain all the interfaces, so theoretically you could just merge these in Valgrind and we could still totally continue working. I haven't tested this, which means it's broken. But yeah, so then there's the problem that Libvex's multi-arch mode doesn't actually work, which is, to, so which is to say that there's this idea of Vex that it can lift, lift from any host and compile to any, lift from any guest and compile to any host, and this will all magically work, and it really, really, really doesn't. Yeah, that doesn't <laughs> oh, I've got some good news about you about some patches we'd like to upstream. <laughs> And furthermore, uh, furthermore, there's 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 a lot of assumptions made in there's, in the various parts of various lifters that the host is the same as the guest, and that's nasty. So we have patches for that. Um, furthermore, we'd like to be able to use Anger to analyze things that aren't just user land program. We like we had a project a few months ago, a few years ago, about analyzing some x86 firmware. So we have some patches that make it feasible to analyze real mode programs in x86. Um, and then again, then one of the final things that we want to do is in just sort of generally improve the meta properties of the IR that dynamic execution ignores, but static execution really, really needs. Like, for example, making sure that all the jump kinds are always accurate. So at the end of each VEX block, when you translate from one block of VEX IR to another block of VEX IR, there is a jump kind, which is what kind of jump is it? Is it a boring jump? Is it a function call? Is it a function return? Is it a sys call? What do you want to do? So that's not, really, that's not really necessary if you're just executing through the code. But once you're performing analysis on it, you need to sort of start keeping track of what function you're in. It's very important that that's right all the time. So there's a couple of cases where that was wrong, and now it's right. Is it really knowable? Nothing is ever really knowable. <laughs> <laughs> Some of the uh, jump kinds, particularly the, the spot function returns, are impossible for. It's like we'd really not love to know that because then we could make code and work on all the platforms. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it seems to me impossible to know. Yeah, there's. Uh, there's actually currently an issue open on, on our end about one of our post processors that is overzealous about mar as, at marking something as a return. So we need, to be, we need a better heuristic for that. But all the patches that I'm about to present are good as far as we know. They're, they're strictly better. Okay, let me not distract you. Yeah. <laughs> so let's take a look. Um, I'm going to run that huge, get, that huge bash command, and we're going to cycle through all the commits, all 30 of them. And we're going to take a look at what exactly I've done. <laughs> Uh, is that I please tell me that's in my history. Please. Okay, I guess I can just copy that. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad I I'm glad I kept it around. Hang on. Yeah, that's the one. Anyway. So we use git, not SVN, because we love ourselves. 
So our first commit in our repository is just importing um, R3299 at SVN. This is, um, that, was re that was the most recent commit as of about a week ago. I rebased everything on top of the current master. So this should all be good. So it's, this is just import vex into git. So the next thing we do this is just adding a git ignore and readme and Ah, it's important. Uh, hang on. Good. All right. First off, tile GX doesn't work in multi-arch mode for some reason. Um, the, 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 make, the make file just sitting in the VEX repository seems to have been not updated in a very long time. It doesn't even include the object files for the tile GX code. Uh, <coughs> yeah. Yeah, and I, and I, and I, I was looking at those messages and I'm like, hmm, maybe I shouldn't put in the effort to support this. <laughs> so disable tile GX in multi-arch mode. Second one, in x86, it's important we make we um, switch these LDT and GDT registers from being H words to being U longs. The goal is that they take up a consistent amount of space, regardless of the guest, ar regardless of the host architecture. And this is important because we have a st we have a static mapping and, and anger of all of the offsets in the guest in the guest in the guest register file, and we'd like to not have to have some magic way of updating that regard depending on what your analysis platform is. Next, we clean up the build system. Um, this is just a big cleanup of the libvex build system. It is big and it is clean and it paves the way and oh this is actually an important change I should go over. Um, where's the gen offsets program? Right. So there's this public <laughs> Look, I'm doing my best. So there's this program called gen offsets in the, in the libvex build process, which generates this public header, pub slash libvex underscore guest underscore offsets dot h. And the idea is to hold on to, uh, to ha have there be a public record of what the actual offsets into the host file, into the guest register files are. Like, what offsets do you need to look into the register file to find EAX or R0 on ARM or R0 on PowerPC? Um, Previously, there was a real hacked up grep into sed into something to make everything work. But because of that change that we just made, the one with changing the H words to the U longs, now everything is consistent across every platform. And we can just, we can use, I mean, we can use something much simpler in order to actually, gra in order to grab those offsets. In this case, it just compiles, compile a program that includes, all, and that just runs the size of macro a billion times and, Dumps them all out and just dumps them all out into that header file. Does this work even when cross compiling? Huh? Does this work even when cross compiling? Yes, that's the idea. Right. <laughs> Next, support compiling for Windows via NSVC. This is. <laughs> this was not fun. <laughs> um, it's uh, a lot. It's basically a whole bunch of, yeah, the, the, the real kicker is um, def, we, we condition out a whole bunch of weird vars code with another version that MSVC understands. We, OK, and then here's the stuff where we just do a bunch of defines to stub out all the GCC specific functionality. Um, I haven't, I got it to work at one point and then my Windows machine fell over and died so I'm not really sure how well it works right now. But it worked and it can probably work given about 30 minutes of dead time and a working Windows machine. And then there's just a whole bunch of things about, for example, MSV can't, C can't handle empty anonymous structs. So et cetera, et cetera. Just a bunch of random hacks like that. It's just, it sh shouldn't be any overhead. It's just weird stuff. Next is, Next is um, next is we replace. There's this adder type, which is the which is this generic host word that sort of switches between 30, 62 and 32 bits based on the architecture. That's no good because then you can't analyze 64 bit from a 32 bit host. Yeah, yeah, that's pollution. It should never have gotten there. That's 
So we just, and th this is a bit of a hack. It should probably be addressed more carefully, but for the time being, it just needs to be 64 wide. Next, we add a, a next we deal add a function called libvex update control. There's this vex control structure, which is sort of a global variable floating around in vex that can add that adds the ability to have these sort of they're just a set of global options for how the optimization process should work. And we want we, we, for the you're only allowed to set this once is the, is the problem. You set this in the libvex init function, and then you're never allowed to touch it again, which is not ideal when you want to update, for example, the, the maximum number of instructions that you'd like to lift. And later on in this thing, I'm going to add a couple more options. And it's useful to have them partitioned out like this. So cool. Next, next is the thing I'm talking about. We split libvex translate into libvex lift and libvex cogen. So it's not a huge deal. We just here is it? Ah, it's you can't really see it, but there's but libvex translate has just become just these green just these green lines right here, which calls libvex lift, libvex cogen, return res, you're done. Not super hard. Next is we add a we add a parameter to the vex control that is maximum number of bytes per lift. There is the there's already a concept of maximum number of instructions per lift, but we would also like to be able to have a maximum number of bytes per lift. Useful. Furthermore, there are a lot of weird optimizations that happen in the lifting process, which we which are have negative effects on analysis. For example, in the arm mode, on, in the arm thumb mode lifting, um, it tries to do this look back behind the current instructions to see if any of them could be could have been a conditional instruction. And if they're not, it means you can optimize the hell out of that code. However. There, there's use cases from Pyvex that, that doesn't make sense, where there isn't code, there doesn't exist code behind the current code, you, that, where you, there's not a continuous mapping of just the code segments. So we need to be able to disable that behavior. So then, so then, previously the arm lifter's endness, endness, endness was dependent on the host, which doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. So. Now we're dealing with the guests, and furthermore, it involves just some change, some changes to make sure that you lift the, you pull words out of memory with the correct endness, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Next, I have no idea why this code ever works, but here it is. Um, at some point, you just take the guest access, cast it to a host pointer, and try dereferencing it. And that makes absolutely no sense. So here's a fix. Can I make a suggestion? Yes. The, the, this is a lot of relatively small changes. Yes. Um, did you want to talk about also, because time is limited, yeah. talk also about changing the IR? Mm -hmm. That's a much harder problem. Ch I mean, this, this is like, yeah, OK, so yeah. largely it's no big deal. Yeah, there are no real changes to the IR. We like VEX a lot. We like the way it is, and we don't have any solutions for sort of the okay. architectural problems. Said, for example, it doesn't give um, many real representation of what happens in between basic blocks. We don't have an answer for that. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you had this. Yeah. No. <laughs> God. No. I wish. Yeah. Um, I guess I can talk about this more in sort of terms of general patterns that Valgren doesn't support what we would like to. For example, there is uh, there's previously the assertion that when you have a service call, a syscall on an arm, the service call number must be zero. And when you're analyzing weird firmware, that's not always the case. I mean, there's a lot of small changes. Yeah, a lot of small changes. So, yeah. It's really the architecture level stuff that's hard to do. I mean, the top level structure. Yeah. I think at this point I've explained all the structural changes. I stuck those pretty early in the commit history. If you've been watching the dates, they've been jumping back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. Um, what's, that, what's something structural that we can talk about? MIPS to. So, can I ask you a maybe different question, which is if you actually just shove this lot into the, the standard Valgrim, mm -hmm. does it still work? I haven't tried it, but it should. It really should, because I'll. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I did. I took some care to make sure that all the interfaces were preserved, and that any new options that I added defaulted to the original behavior. 
So, um, um, let's see. Anything other else that's interesting? Anything interesting? Blah, blah, blah. Blah. OK. Then this is a huge commit that adds support for analyzing x86 real mode code. So we add a parameter to the arch info that is the CR0 x86 register. And so that controls a big chunk of the new x86 lifting logic. Um, and also involves um, handling the LDT, GDT registers correctly. And it's just reorganization. It's pretty fundamental and sort of needs to drive home the idea that VEX has uses outside of analyzing real mode programs dynamically. So optimization. And there's a weird type error I found. And that's all 30 commits. So go back to here. That was a lot. <laughs> that was a lot less than it could have been. Um, I spent the last two weeks cleaning up our three years of mess of commit history and packaging it into this series of 30 meaningful patches. So I have put in a lot of work to make this nice and hopefully just ready to be accepted given some testing. So some future ideas that are, these are some more architectural, some, some architectural, some structural changes. Um, my understanding is that the origin of the C calls in VEX are that they were originally copied from Quimu. I don't know how true this is, but the, the idea that there's some, that these, for example, when VEX wants to calculate the E flags for an x86 jump instruction, like, we, well, there's the, so in x86 you can say jump if less than or equal to. And what that actually does is it checks just the bit, a bit in the condition flags that get set every time you do a math operation. And so VEX doesn't want to recalculate those, those condition flags every single instruction. So it saves off the operators and the operand for every math instruction it does. All the unnecessary ones get folded out by the optimizer. And then when it actually sees that it needs to calculate the bits of the E flags register, it calls out to this sort of external function which, know, which magically knows how to take the operation and the operands and return whether the branch passes or not. So, and it's totally possible that, it, and the existence of these C calls is a hindrance to analysis and optimization and lots of things. So it would be nice in the future if we could inline all these C calls as just IR. Um, furthermore, having there be a concept, having there be fed safety in libvex would be very, 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 very nice because. I mean, we're in Python, so it doesn't make a whole lot of difference. But there are all so many optimi there are many um, applications for us which are which live mostly in libvex. For example, we do have a rock chain generator that most of its lifetime is spent in libvex. So if we could multi-thread that, it would be very, very, very fast. Um, this is hard because vex is designed to make zero assumptions about its outside model, so it has no access to anything that could possibly give it thread local storage, there would probably end up being a callback that, that it would call that is just saying, hey, whoever's invoking me, please give me my thread local storage block. And it would do that. But that would involve moving literally every single global and libvex into that huge thread local storage struct. So it's hard, but it would be useful and it would require a lot of refactoring. Um, so multi-arch mode works at least now from a little endian host. We've tested this pretty extensively from 32-bit and 64-bit little endian hosts. You can lift without faults all architectures. We haven't tested this with big, with big, big endian hosts. And I'm, my feeling is that it's going to fail if you try to lift some x86 on a MIPS processor. Um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's not important. This is very urgent. The indentation in libvex is three spaces. That's, that feels like some sort of joke. <laughs> <laughs> Any, one space would be better than three spaces, honestly. Um, so we need to discuss what color the paper bike shirt so on a separate note, on a more less joke-filled note, licensing is a bit of an issue. So 
For the Vex is GPL. This is a little scary because we don't want Angular to be GPL. Our university wants Angular, wants all our code to be BSD. And we have this belief that we've sufficiently insulated ourselves from dependency on libvex because through having there be multiple lifter backends to pyvex, having no real strict d dependency on the exact list of enums that come out of libvex. But in, in, in the end, it ends up being this weird legal question of what does the GPL cover? Does the GPL cover the implementation of libvex or does li the GPL cover the concept of the vex IR? And we really don't want to find out the answer to that question. So what, the easiest thing that would, what the easiest thing we think would be for there to be a, this, there's this library license exception, runtime library exception that gets added to, um, libc, for example, which is GPL, but there's no, but, but, but just because you link with libc doesn't mean that you're required for your program to also be GPL. So that would, that's probably something that needs to be discussed in depth, but that's an important issue that's important to the livelihood of Anger and me. So that's pretty much it. That's the anger project. That's our interactions with Libvex. And that's me being funny on stage for an hour. I will be glad to take any questions that you have. <laughs> questions? So the jumps problems that you have, I understand that it's hard to know sometimes impossible. But is it, um, <laughs> is it mostly because of organizations and like inlining or, or is, it, is there anything else more fundamental that would stop you from knowing how to go back? Because he said that you, you need more information. He said that you can't leave the other than an hour. I'm just trying to yeah. So the, the nightmare case is the, um, on arm and thumb. There is no such thing as a write instruction. There is just this weird instruction which pops a number of things off of the stack and puts them into various registers. And this can include the program counter. So, Dozens of ways to return. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It, it, so it's just, uh, but that's like a return, right? You yeah. PC, yeah. So that, uh, that, that's that's the heuristic that we tried to implement, and it's not. I, I, I'm the exact issue that's coming up isn't right, but it's not a CFG problem. It's an instruction problem. It's an instruction problem. But that's easier to solve. I think. I think there are. I think there are some CFG problems, but like. No, no, there probably is. Yes, absolutely. Those are the impossible ones to solve. Mm -hmm. I, I think, and I think. I'm not the person who deals with CFG. That's a very, 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 very smart person named Fish, a PhD student in our lab. Yeah. Um, there's a, there's a, we, ha we have lots of code. We have a very complicated control flow recovery algorithm. Um, it, I'm pretty sure there are considerations for the CFG ca based cases in there. So, but of course, nothing is perfect. Everything is unknowable. Anything else? How do you deal with? Syscall instructions or memory locations that depends on things you might not know, for example? Yeah. Uh, so you mentioned mem memory locations. This is a general problem in symbolic execution. What do you do when you have a store to a memory address that's symbolic? And the answer is we give you a lot of tools to decide what to do. So you can either concretize the memory storage address, you can concretize it to a range of possible addresses and store conditionally to all of them, the more the more less tractable it is. Um, it's an open question to what's the best way to do it. And there's lots of publication on what to do it. And we sort of try to provide everything that you can so you can pick what you need to do with your analysis. That's why we call Anger a suite. So you can, you can access tools to do that without mm -hmm. You can access tools to choose something to do with longer about that. Question? Oh, wait, hang on. You mentioned syscalls. Um, there's, we're in the middle of refactoring the, the precise relationship between um, an Angular pr or a program running in Angular and its environment. But the idea is that there, we, oh boy. So I mentioned that Simuvex has can do things other than just execute Vex. Well, one of them is execute a syscall, and so the main top level loop is, well, if we see that the previous jump kind is IJK sys, instead of running vex, we run the syscall engine, and then the next time we see that we're all well, trying to execute more vex. Yeah, but that depends on the uh, actual context you're running your, your, your 
the human nation. Yeah. It's, uh, basically, how, how do you, how do you, because if, because it's static, uh, static analysis, so if you have, for example, read uh, syscall on something that does not exist at the analysis time. So you're talking about, for example, what does the open file syscall do? Yeah, for example. Um, it just creates the idea that, well, there's two cases. Either the open succeeded and it didn't. If it didn't succeed, you can create a su successor state with a failure state of that state. And if it did succeed, you create a concept of a f open file with unknown contents, symbolic contents. So that any, so it will return a file descriptor. And then any time you r read off that file descriptor, it will return symbolic data or, and also the possibility of EOF. Basically, you also emulate the operating system. It's big. You, I mean, this is a project we've been doing basically nonstop for the last three years, four years. It's big. About your S17 coding, how do you handle 14-point numbers? <laughs> Z3 has support, for primitive support for floating point numbers. Yeah. It does work. Um, it's very, very, very buggy. Um, we found numerous seg faults in Z3 we were unable to track down to a root cause. So sometimes what we do is, I think the approach that we took during the CGC for maximum resiliency was every time we see a floating point operation, we just say, throw up our hands, nothing we can do, concretize any symbolic values that turn into floating point, and then every time we see an actual operation, we just turn them into Python floats, add them, put them back into bit vectors. So then this, this maintains tractability, and usually when there's bugs, they don't often come from floating point nonsense. If we wanted to really put our net, if, if Z3 works, then we could just put everything through Z3's symbolic IEEE 754. Yeah, uh, I work with Z3 as well. Okay. Uh, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, if you have a floating point nonsense, then you can just put much better than that. Yeah, there's, a, there's an interesting amount of research out there about um, for frameworks like this, which just want a solution to something, what you can just do is you can spin up any number of, of uh, SAT solvers in parallel and just use the one of whatever, whichever one returns first. Use the result. So that's, that's an approach that we've wanted to implement for a while using, wh which one did you say was good? MatSat. MatSat. Yeah. Interesting. OK, thank you very much. Anything else? That will be all.